Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And we begin with question number one from Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the potential economic impact... Yes, yes, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Graham. Uh, can we just check... There we are. Thank you. Uh, Linda Fabiani, can take two, please? <laughs> Thank you again, Presiding Officer. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the potential economic impact on East Kilbride, what its response is to reports that HMRC has leased premises in Glasgow to progress the closure plans for East Kilbride Centre One. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The power to collect and manage taxes raised in Scotland remains reserved to the UK Parliament and this includes the decisions about HMRC office locations. The Scottish Government is clear that these powers should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament and the decisions about tax should be founded on close engagement with the taxpayer community in Scotland and on consideration of best practice from elsewhere. The Scottish Government is clear that it has deep concerns over HMRC's transformation programme not least for the potential negative impacts it would have in local communities, including East Cobride. Linda Fabiani. Can, uh, can I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary if he has in fact noted that the staff capacity of the Glasgow location is less than that of East Cobride alone, never mind to be used for other offices such as that in Cumbernauld? And does he agree with PCS Union? that with Brexit uncertainty and reports of tax avoidance, the vision should be for a fully funded HMRC that can close the tax gap rather than reduce staff numbers and close local offices with the impact that will have. Derek Mackay. I've listened uh, very closely to what uh, Linda Fabiani has said. She's been very strong on these uh, matters and the Scottish Government has raised their concerns uh, with the UK Government uh, whilst recognising uh, their uh, decision-making role uh, in this. I make the point again, of course, if we had the powers over that tax administration and collection uh, coming to the Scottish Parliament, we would be able to create the kind of service that would be uh, specifically tailored to Scotland's needs and would take those operational decisions uh, in light of such issues that uh, Linda Fabiani has raised. So I'll continue to take forward uh, those concerns uh, and raise those matters uh, with counterparts in the UK Government. Question number two, Miles Briggs. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions ministers have had regarding the future regeneration of Edinburgh's waterfront. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Scottish ministers were involved with discussions with the city region partners of the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city region deal. Uh, this deal had its heads of term signing in July 2017, which included a commitment to supporting the delivery of a significant number of new homes across the region by unlocking seven strategic sites, including Edinburgh's waterfront. Scottish Government officials also meet with colleagues from the Council on a regular basis and have been kept up to date with plans for the Edinburgh waterfront. Uh, my officials attended a meeting yesterday led by the Chief Executive of the Council where further details of their plans and aspirations to create transformational change in this area of the city were shared. Miles Briggs. Minister, for that answer, does the Minister agree with me that we have an unrealised potential in Edinburgh's waterfront and that connecting communities from Cranman to Portobello would provide many regenerational, cultural and leisure opportunities? What discussions have Ministers had regarding proposals for the development and relocation, for example, of the National Galleries of Scotland collection facility in Granton, a project which I believe could act as a real catalyst to help the regeneration of this section of the capital's waterfront? And would the Minister commit to attend a, sum a summit, which I'm looking to arrange with other elected members and key stakeholders later in the year to help take forward a vision for the future of Edinburgh's waterfront? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In terms of the National Gallery, I think that uh, Mr Briggs would be better placed writing to my colleague Fiona Hislop uh, around about that. But I'm pleased that the City of Edinburgh Council is developing plans for uh, the waterfront area. Uh, this work offers a significant opportunity to create transformational change, as I've already said, and to create a sustainable neighbourhood and reconnect the city with its waterfront. Uh, and I will ensure that my officials continue to work collaboratively with the Council towards agreeing a vision uh, and the outcomes for the area and look at how the public sector uh, collaboration could support the delivery of these outcomes. Presiding officer, through the uh, city region deal, um, regeneration uh, at Edinburgh uh, waterfront will be helped by our commitment to 
provide housing infrastructure, funding of up to £50 million of predominantly private sector loans to be spent on projects that will unlock housing in uh, strategic development areas across the region, including the waterfront here in Edinburgh. We'll prioritise and work with partners to support uh, council borrowing and share the financing risk of infrastructure delivery required across these key sites. Uh, and uh, we also have supported the construction of a new road at Granton Waterfront, uh, which will allow the provision of 104 affordable new homes uh, by Port of Leith Housing Association. And that road will also allow access where approximately a further 300 affordable uh, homes can be provided in a later phase. And through our affordable housing uh, programme, uh, we are currently planning to support... Mr Stewart, there's the another question. Years. You have a question, uh, a supplementary on this, so you'll have time to expand on that. If I may take the supplementary from Ben McPherson. OK. Thank you very much, President Officer. Improving Edinburgh's waterfront is an issue I've been working on since elected, and I want to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to the significant potential for regeneration of Edinburgh's waterfront, particularly in terms of delivering more affordable housing. And what consideration the Scottish Government has given to overcoming any barriers to investment in order to encourage and enable development, particularly in the Granton and Wester Harbin areas? Minister. Um, President Officer, I've already mentioned the new road and the 104 uh, affordable homes by Port of Leith Housing Association and the ability uh, to uh, allow for an, ex an additional 300 affordable homes uh, at a later phase. Uh, and through our affordable housing uh, supply programme, uh, we're currently planning to support over the next few years a project with Link Housing Association uh, and two further projects with the Port of Leith Housing Association, which will provide up to 538 affordable homes in the area and receive around £22 million of Scottish Government grant. Uh, presiding officer, um, that is a suite of proposals uh, and a number uh, um, of uh, budgetary uh, uh, things that will actually ensure uh, that uh, the waterfront uh, develops as envisioned envisaged by Mr McPherson and others. So the government is doing a great deal uh, to help support the vision for Edinburgh's waterfront. Question number three, Claire Hockey. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with the Two Sisters Food Group regarding its consultation on closing its factory in Cambus Lang. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I have written to the Chief Executive of Two Sisters Food Group to make clear our desire to work with him and his team uh, to ensure a sustainable future for production in the Cambus Lang area. The Scottish Government's main economic development agency, Scottish Enterprise, is exploring options with the company to help achieve this aim. While our primary focus is on identifying actions that can protect employment at the site, given the consultation that is now underway, we have also offered support to employees that may be affected through our Partnership Action for Continuous Employment initiative. Uh, the local PACE team is meeting with the management of the Two Sisters Food Group on the 5th of March. Claire Hockey. I thank the Minister for that answer. Since the announcement of the factory's proposed closure earlier this month, I've been working with relevant stakeholders to ensure the long-term viability of the site. I've met with senior management, the workers, trade unions and neighbouring local businesses to ensure that I'm doing all I possibly can to support the 450 jobs at the plant. Indeed, the local community have set up a campaign to save this business, demonstrating just how important this issue is locally. These potential job losses would be devastating for the local economy, not only in Cambus Lang, but also in surrounding areas. Will the Minister give me and the workers and the community the assurance that this government will leave no stone unturned in finding a positive resolution for the plant? Minister. Um, well, firstly, Presiding Officer, can I commend Claire Hockey for her uh, involvement in trying to support the workforce and indeed the company in securing uh, a long-term future for the site. Uh, I can absolutely give assurance to Claire Hockey that the Scottish Government is committed to working with the company, with the trade unions and the workforce and the local authority to provide every support possible to help ensure a productive future for the Camas Lang site and its workforce. And I'm happy to continue to work with Claire Hockey, who I know has shown great interest in contacting me directly to see what help we can provide, but keen to work with all local stakeholders and elected members to make that happen. So our question four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will take forward the Ayrshire Growth Deal, given it has not yet received UK Government support. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. 
Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to growth deals covering all of Scotland, and as I have previously made clear, and this includes the Ayrshire's, uh, we also, of course, have already committed £5.3 million to the HALO project in Kilmarnock. Uh, and I'd also recognise the hard work done by all three local authorities that's gone into preparing proposals for the Ayrshire growth deal and welcome the steps towards creating a regional economic partnership to steer the region towards greater inclusive growth. In line with the commitment to be made to 100% of coverage of Scotland with growth deals, we want the UK Government to join us in this common purpose. I last met with the Secretary of State on the 1st of February to discuss this issue and we've agreed to meet again shortly to explore how best to make further progress. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. For over 18 months, the people of Ayrshire have waited for the UK Government to take forward the growth deal. However, despite heavy hints, winks and suggestions dating back over a year, we appear to be no further forward in relation to a commencement date, meaning Ayrshire is likely to fall further behind other more prosperous parts of Scotland with deals already in place. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that even a truncated deal involving the three Ayrshire local authorities and Scottish Government would allow at least some investment priority projects to begin and possibly encourage the UK Government to finally get its finger out and invest in Ayrshire? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, well, can I say that I share the member's frustration about the length of time taken to come to a conclusion on this, but I think in my substantive answer I said that we are committed to growth deals across the whole of Scotland, and that perhaps provides part of the answer to the member's question in relation to the Scottish Government's intent. But we do have a preference to work in partnership with the UK Government, not least because that obviously expands the amount of work and the amount of resources that can go in uh, to any particular deal. Uh, and we want to maximise the investment and opportunities for Ayrshire. I will be reminding the Secretary of State when we meet that progress on the deal cannot be delayed forever and we will all need to move much more quickly to ensure that Ayrshire can capitalise on the opportunities presented by their growth deal proposals. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I noticed there is no line in the Scottish Budget which passed yesterday for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. So perhaps I could offer the Cabinet Secretary the opportunity to update Parliament today how much, in financial terms, his government is committing to the Ayrshire Growth Deal. Cabinet Secretary. Well, you'll find there is a provision, of course, within the budget for growth deals, but it's also true to say that I have made explicit, as have other members of the government, that we are committed to the growth deal. If we had that same commitment from the UK government, However much, however much has been talked about, it's substantially more than the zero pounds currently being proposed by the yeah, UK government, can I say. Yeah. We will take forward this deal. Yeah. We hope the UK government will take it forward as well. But until they do that, we can't make any progress. We've been committed to every growth deal so far. And I've just said, this government is committed to a growth deal in every part of Scotland. Question number five, Bruce Crawford. Uh, to ask, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government where it will provide an update on the progress regarding the Stirling Clark Manninshire city region deal. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, again, the Scottish Government remains fully committed to a city region deal for Stirling and Clubmanager, and we've been leading engagement with the city region partners and the UK Government throughout the process. We remain engaged in discussion with the UK Government and the city region partners to agree and deliver the best possible deal for the region, and we're working to conclude these negotiations and to reach a heads of terms agreement as soon as possible. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. I'd be grateful the Cabinet Secretary could confirm. What the additional amount of monies he committed in the city region deals as a result of the successful passing of the budget yesterday, not supported by either the Tories or the Labour Party? And can the Cabinet Secretary also confirm what progress has been made in regard to the very generous offer of the UK Government to gift land at MOD Forside if it becomes redundant in future? And can he also confirm or otherwise the helpfulness of the local Tory Conservative MPs in a process that's been meant to be partnership. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, can I say, first of all, the scale of government investment in the deal and the projects included within it will, of course, be subject to negotiation both between governments and also the city region partners. I think there's around £120 million of provision made for city deals generally by the, the Finance Secretary in the budget. But we do not yet have an understanding of the UK government's contribution to the deal. Uh, and also, in relation to the particular point, I have to say to the member that, yes, he is right to say an explicit commitment was given by the UK government, by Lord Duncan, that MOD land would be transferred at no cost, additional to the city deal, and decontaminated. I have to say to the member, I don't think that commitment still holds. And perhaps he and other members with an interest in this might want to question the UK government whether they intend to see through that commitment, both in terms of the Stirling deal and also in terms of the Tay Cities deal. But the Scottish government's contribution for our part will be genuinely additional. 
and it will also be wholly new capital investment that would not be happening without the city region deal. We have incidentally committed over a billion pounds on city deals for Glasgow, Aberdeen, Inverness and Edinburgh. We are the biggest contributors towards city deals. We want to see a successful deal here and I only wish that some of the local Conservative members, MSPs and MPs, had taken the constructive approach that we've seen in relation to other city deals instead of the sniping and the undermining of this yeah, process absolutely. which yeah. is doing a damage both to Stirling and Club Manager in terms of seeing through the city deal. They should get behind the people of Stirling Club Manager and get behind this deal. Mark Ruskell. Thank, thank you. Can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's growing support for repurposing the MOD site for social housing, which is desperately needed in Stirling. But can I ask him about Clack Manager? Clack Manager was added relatively late on in the city deal process. So how will the Scottish Government ensure that both communities in the Stirling area and Clack Manager area benefit from the city deal? Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, Mark Russell makes a, a good point. Uh, now, how we've helped is not least, first of all, by providing um, unusually, uh, for, in fact, for the first time, additional support to the Council, given both the Council size and the fact that it came to the deal later on. The additional support through SFT and through Scottish Government officials to help them formulate their proposals, and good progress has been made uh, with the proposals coming from Club Manager Council. I only wish, incidentally, that the UK Government, when it's mentioned this deal at all in Parliament, had mentioned the word Club Manager twice, it said it would do, but has never mentioned Club Manager. Club Manager is a very vital part of this deal, just as Stirling is. And I would reassure the member that the Scottish Government, for our part, will do what we can to assist in the redevelopment of uh, Club Manager and Stirling, and will take both, uh, both parts of the, the city region deal together. And I'm very pleased that both Club Manager and Stirling have agreed to work together on this deal. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. Can I remind uh, the Cabinet Secretary and Bruce Crawford, for that matter, the budget passed yesterday is based on extra real terms funding coming from the UK Government to the Scottish Government. So when will the Cabinet Secretary stop playing politics, show leadership and start spending some of this extra funding for the benefit of the people of Stirling and Clack Manager? Cabinet Secretary. I think once again Dean Lockhart misunderstands the process. These city deals are agreed by all the parties and we announce when all the parties are agreed and satisfied with the proposals. But what people in Stirling Club Manager will be very well aware of is that he and his colleagues demanded that we put in the budget city deal provision for deals like this and then voted against that budget yeah, yesterday, yeah. including those resources. Yeah. People will not forget the actions of the Conservative yeah. MSPs and MPs. Yeah. Question number six, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding safeguarding the value of Scottish University staff pensions. Shirley Ann, sorry, Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The Scottish Government officials are closely monitoring developments and have sought updates from stakeholders on this issue, including from the UK Government. I encourage both sides to engage in further talks to find a resolution to this issue. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for that response and express solidarity and indeed that of the Scottish Green Party with constituents at the Scottish Association of Marine Science in Oban today and indeed all members of the ECU across the country out in strike and I'm sure they'll also welcome the support of the NUS. The UCU have stated that changes to the, the pension scheme could see members lose up to £200,000. Now, I appreciate that there's no direct role for the Scottish Government, but can the Minister advise if she's had discussed this issue with the Universities UK, and will she also encourage Scottish University principals to get back to meaningful talks to resolve the dispute, please? Minister. Well, as the member points out, this is not a government-funded pension scheme, so there is no direct locus for the Scottish Government as autonomous institutions such as universities, uh, their staff uh, pay and conditions are matters, of course, for the universities. I would say, however, that the Scottish Government is monitoring the, so the, the situation um, very, very closely and engaging with the relevant stakeholders. Indeed, I had a meeting with UCU officials on Tuesday, which they deemed to be a very constructive meeting, to discuss their concerns about the, the lack of uh, discussions. Uh, I would encourage, as I said in my original answer, both sides to get back to the negotiating table and engage in further talks. That's the right thing for uh, the UCU and their members, and it's the right thing for students. Question number seven, Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what it's doing to improve support for pupils with additional support needs. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, we want all children and young people to get the support that they need to reach their full potential. We continue to support education authorities in meeting their duties under the Additional Support for Learning Act to identify, provide for and review the additional su support needs of their pupils. We have empowered children through the extension of their rights under the Additional Support for Learning Act. 
This landmark extension of rights is supported by a new children's service funded by the Scottish Government. We have also published further guidance on a children's learning code of practice on supporting children with health care needs in schools and on complaints to Scottish ministers. Annie Wells. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Despite the number of pupils identified with the SN is increasing by 47% since 2012, we know resources are dwindling. The number of additional support for learning teachers has fallen by 12% since 2012, and latest figures show that local authority spending has dropped by £459 per pupil since 2012, representing an 11% cut. Based on these figures and the feeling amongst teachers that not enough time is being devoted to ASN training, does the Cabinet Secretary truly believe that adequate support is being provided? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, the uh, number of staff supporting pupils with additional support needs um, increased between 2015 and 16, the latest figures for which are available, and we will get the figures for 2017 shortly. <coughs> um, this is a matter for local authorities to determine the amount of resources that they put in place to support the special needs of young people, but they have statutory obligations that they are obliged to, to, to meet. And finally, presiding officer, it is a bit rich. The day after the Conservatives argued for less public expenditure, yeah. tax cuts for the rich, and less investment in the budget, and voted against the budget to raise the question of extra spending with me in relation to this particular yeah. issue. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. And before we move on to First Minister's questions, uh, I am sure members will wish to join me in welcoming to our gallery Mr. Andre Antoine, President of the Parliament of Wallonia. <laughs> and can I also ask members to join me in welcoming Anne Jones, EM, Deputy Presiding Officer of the National Assembly for Wales. <laughs> 